Hello everyone, this is Brother Carl Tester and before us now is Revelation chapter 14 and this is part 1 and I'm going to call this chapter a lamb standing although it does deal with several different things. The Lamb of God is central to this chapter and indeed everything else for that matter. Now, if you are watching this the video of this presentation you are going to notice if you are observant that I have used an image of a sheep throughout and this was not intended and it has been brought to my attention by my wife and she carefully reviews everything and this is very helpful to me but I'm going to let this aspect through on this occasion and trust that you will understand that we are talking about the Lamb of God so with that out of the way I'm going to get on with it Revelation 14 is a parenthetical chapter situated between Revelation 13 and the development of pagan Rome into its most dreadful form as papal Rome and of course with this came tremendous ecclesiastical and temporal tyranny and then on the other side of this is Revelation 15 and 16 and beyond which sets forth the vials of God's wrath being poured out against that same system. In between this is Revelation 14 and the Lamb standing and with him the 144,000 which are the redeemed of the Lord. When we looked at Revelation 13 the situation was very dire indeed. God's people were being overcome, worn out and killed and in the natural it looked utterly hopeless. After reading Revelation 13 we might be excused for asking the questions as to why do the wicked always seem to prosper? Why does the devil seem to get away with so much in this world? And what about God's people? Are they always going to be despised, rejected, crushed and put to death? What is God really doing for his people? Is it simply a matter of his people having to grit their teeth and put up with it until they die and then their reward only comes after this? How can the redeemed remain joyful during such times as these? How can they fare well if they are constantly being hounded like wild animals all of their lives? Revelation 14 is here now to encourage the saints to keep on. As Jesus said in Matthew 24, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Or over in Revelation 21, he that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Or what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4, where it says, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. And we need to remember that Paul went through tremendous physical suffering, which he termed light affliction. So with all these things in mind, with all the terrible events in Revelation chapter 13, we are reminded in Revelation 14 verse 1, And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Sion, and with him a hundred forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder, and I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. Verse 3, And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne, and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the hundred and forty and four thousand which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the firstfruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in verse 5, And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Now, insofar as the 144,000 are concerned, I direct you back to Revelation 7, part 2, for an explanation concerning this. This is another symbol used in a book of symbols to designate the sealed of God, the remnant according to the election of grace, as it says in Romans 11, verse 5. The meaning of the 144,000 in Revelation 7 is the same as the meaning in Revelation 14, only that in Revelation 7 it was set against the background of Revelation 6 
and now in Revelation 14 it is set against the background of Revelation 13 and I'm going to look at this in a moment. In Revelation 14 we have further information uh, concerning these. They are the redeemed, they are virgins, they follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth, they are firstfruits, in their mouth is no guile and they are without fault. Obviously with all those markers we can quickly identify them, identify them as the saved of God in this New Testament period and they are also those who are going through tremendous suffering at the hands of this fourth world empire. Revelation 13 brings before us this great anti-Christian papal Roman beast and we see the whole world wandering after it, the killing of the saints and the mark of the beast and so on. In contrast to the inhabitants of the earth bowing down in subservience to this beast back in Revelation 13, when we come to chapter 14, we see God's own, the 144,000, not with the mark of the beast, but with the Father's name written in their foreheads, which is, of course, the name of Jesus. They are standing with the Lamb. They have not worshipped the beast. They have not bowed the knee before the idol as it were. Similarly, back in Revelation chapter 6, where we saw pagan Rome in charge, and there under the altar we saw the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And then when we move to the very next chapter, in chapter 7, we saw the 144,000, the saved of God, the remnant according to the election of grace. And we can see that in both instances, under pagan Rome and then under papal, papal Rome, God has his remnant. He will never be left without a faithful witness on this earth. Praise the Lord. So let us note that the placing of the position of the 144,000 in chapter 14, following on from the persecution of God's people, as recorded in chapter 13, is the same as the position of the 144,000 given back in chapter 7, which was given following the severe persecutions foretold under pagan Rome in chapter 6. In Revelation 6, if you recall, we saw the martyrs under pagan Rome, and there they cried out for judgment. The souls of the slain under the altar cried out for judgment, and then the reply came back that they were to rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. And that was a prophecy that was looking forward to another company of martyrs that were to come in the future, those who would suffer over a far greater period of time and in far greater numbers. And these were those that were put to death under papal Rome as seen in Revelation chapter 13. So the positioning of the 144,000 following on from Revelation 6 and then also following on from Revelation 13 shows us that these events are connected with the fourth world empire. The only difference is that this fourth world empire has changed from its pagan form to its papal form. And now to extrapolate this just a little bit further in order to show that the repeating pattern that we're seeing here demonstrates that we are dealing with the right people in the right place and at the right time. So we see this in Revelation 6, we have that period under pagan Rome with its 10 specific periods of persecution against the Christians, which ended with the 10th and greatest of all of these persecutions, the Diocletianic persecutions. Then following this, we have Revelation 7 and the 144,000, the sealed of God. And then following that, we have Revelation 8 and 9, which gives us the judgment of God on the Roman Empire, both East, both east and West. Then when we come to Revelation chapter 13, we are in the period of papal Rome, and there they are seeing killing, persecuting the Christians to the point that it seems as though they have utterly worn them out. But then we move across to Revelation 14, and again there is the 144,000, the sealed and preserved of God. And then following this, there is Revelation 15, which is an introduction to Revelation 16 and the vials of wrath that are going to be poured out on that papal Roman system. 
and I'm going to be covering this aspect when we get to those chapters. Revelation 13 presents to us somewhat bad news. The whole world lieth in wickedness. Revelation 14 gives us the good news. Jesus Christ is on the throne. There's a lamb standing in Mount Sion. Revelation 13 gives us the counterfeit, the usurper, the kingdom of men, and the false priesthood, whereas Revelation 14 gives us the original and the authentic. In Revelation 13, we see that the whole world wondered after the beast. This is inclusive of everyone, but in Revelation 14, it is the exclusive, the 144,000. It is the remnant who are saved. In Revelation 13, we have the outwardly professing church. And then in Revelation 14, we have, of course, the true church. In Revelation 13, we have the excommunication and the execution of the saints of God. And in Revelation 14, we have the full communion of the saints with Jesus Christ. Amen. In Revelation 13, we have the majority of people gathered around the throne of the false Christ and his kingdom. In Revelation 14, we have the 144,000 gathered around the throne of the true Christ, the Lamb of God. In this, we see the congregation of Antichrist set up against the congregation of Christ. In Revelation 13, we have the mark of the beast in their right hand and in their foreheads. But in Revelation 14, it is the mark of God in their foreheads. It is those with the helmet of salvation on, those who have the mind of Christ. In Revelation 13, we see the worship of the dragon and the beast. This fourth world empire is satanic and we must always remember this in revelation 14 we see the worship of the lamb of god alone wonderful stuff in revelation 13 the beast is raised up on high it comes up from the sea and uh, there's the dragon giving power unto the beast and they worship the beast saying who is like unto the beast who is able to make make war with him and the whole world wondered after the beast and then we get to revelation 14 and babylon is declared to be fallen is fallen and is to be judged without mixture and i'm going to talk later on about what it is to be judged without without mixture in revelation 13 the saints are copying it sweet they are being oppressed but in Revelation 14, the saints are victorious. They are standing with the Lamb, singing the victor's song. Now, this does not mean that they are free from oppression and persecution. But what it does mean is that they are victorious. They are on the victory side. And we are on the victory side if we are standing with the Lamb. Now, as the Reformation continued to grow and grow and papal power waned, Eventually, the terrible persecutions against the Christians ceased, and that was a wonderful thing and a tremendous victory. However, at this present time, as the days are growing very dark now, and the situation in the world is rapidly deteriorating, so it seems every few weeks and more and more freedoms are being taken from us, whatever lays before us, those that stand with the Lamb are on the victory side, and so we must never, never give up. Amen. We are dealing with the terrible sufferings and martyrdom of God's people, and in Revelation 14, we see that the Lamb is standing with them. Praise the Lord. Now, normally in the New Testament, after Calvary, Jesus is depicted as being seated. And this is because all the work has been done. And so he is seated on the right hand on high. But when it comes to the martyrdom of his people, he is shown standing. And we see this first in Acts 7 verse 55 with the persecution and martyrdom of Stephen who, near to the point of death, said in Acts 7 verse 55, But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing, praise the Lord, standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. And I will take this opportunity to clarify that the scripture says that Jesus is standing on the right hand is not 
the same as saying Jesus is standing at the right hand. This is not a reference to a physical location, but rather it is a scriptural euphemism for being in that position of all power and authority in heaven and in earth. We have previously seen in Revelation chapter 4 that there is only one throne in heaven and that it is Jesus Christ who is seated on that throne. He is no second person in anyone's Roman Catholic Trinity. He is the Father, the everlast everlasting Father, as it says in Isaiah chapter 9. He is the Father who has revealed himself in the flesh of the Son. The phrase, on the right hand of God, is used consistently in the Bible to demonstrate that position of power and authority. We see this in Exodus 15, verse 6. Thy right hand, O Lord, is become glorious in power. Thy right hand, O Lord, hath dashed in pieces the enemy. Psalm 98, verse 1. O sing unto the Lord a new song, for he hath done marvellous things. His right hand and his holy arm hath gotten him the victory. Isaiah 48, verse 13, Mine hand also have la hath laid the foundation of the earth, and my right hand hath spanned the heavens. When I call unto them, they stand up together. Again in Revelation 14, verse 1, They have his father's name written in their foreheads. And then we read in Revelation 3, verse 12, him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from God, and I will write upon him my new name. What is this name? Acts 4 verse 12, Neither is there salvation in any other for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. And this is, of course, the name of Jesus, the name of my God. Also in Revelation 3 verse 12, it tells us that I will write upon him the name of the city of my God. And this is the new Jerusalem. And in Revelation 14 verse 1, where do we see the Lamb standing? He's standing on Mount Sion, which is the new Jerusalem. While much today is said about the old Jerusalem by the prophecy experts, the focus of prophecy in this New Testament era is in fact the New Jerusalem. Galatians 4 verse 26, But Jerusalem which is above is free, which is the mother of us all. And also in Hebrews 12 verse 22, But ye are come unto Mount Sion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels. Now I wish specifically to look at this aspect of Revelation 14, verse 1, the Lamb standing on Mount Sion. In Revelation 13, we saw a lot of dark and gloomy and what may be considered depressing things. We saw this great anti-Christian world government a beast as it was described that came up from the sea and it was animated by the great red dragon. It is satanic and it spoke great things against God and blasphemed his name and also made war with and overcame the people of God. And now standing next to this and in stark contrast to it, we have Revelation 14 and God's response. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Sion, Sion, and with him a hundred and forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. This is the response to, this is the remedy for this great, dreadful and wicked power on earth. Jesus Christ crucified and risen again, and with him are the redeemed. Jesus is not only the answer for each man and woman individually, but also nationally speaking. It's either going to be the kingdom of men, or it's going to be the kingdom of God. And of course, we know that it is only the kingdom of God that can stand and endure forever. Amen. As we look at the world today, we can see that many people have realized the problems that are before us and also that our governments are a big part of the problem. 
They have become larger and larger. They have centralized control more and more. They have become more pervasive in our lives. They have legislated wicked things into law like abortion. And they are rapidly taking our freedoms from us right at the present time under the cloak of the so-called COVID-19 pandemic, now more than ever we can see our basic freedoms evaporating before our eyes. Not slowly as it was being done before, but quite rapidly. Over here in Australia, the situation is deteriorating every single month. The schools, many people realize the schools are now teaching Marxist ideology Sexual perversion is being presented as normal. It's being promoted in the schools to young children. The entertainment industry, big corporations, big pharma are, are all part and parcel of this problem. And many conservative pundits, social and political commentators can see all of these things, but they don't see the proper answer and the remedy. How is it really going to help to overthrow the government and then replace it with another one? How is it going to help to vote the opposition party into power during the next election cycle? How is it going to help to elect a conservative government instead of a liberal government? Others are advocating a return to constitutional law, but how is that going to help unless we return to the law of the Lord? All that will happen is that we will be delaying the inevitable. Unfortunately, many people, including professing Christians, are looking for natural solutions to what is an enormous spiritual problem. The scripture says in Jeremiah 17 verse 5, Thus saith the Lord, Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, and maketh flesh his arm, and whose heart departeth from the Lord. Many Christians have become quite despondent and fearful because of the loss of the presidential election where in 2021 uh, Donald Trump was not re-elected uh, president and doubtless there was a lot of um, evil machinations and shenanigans that went on there to defeat him but irrespective of that we need to understand as Christians that Donald Trump is not the answer, never was. Jesus Christ has always been the answer and always will be and we need to as it says in Hebrews 12 verse 2 look unto Jesus the author and finisher of our faith our hope and our trust has to be in Jesus Christ not in natural man and this is what we have now going from Revelation 13 this diabolical system that's come upon the face of the earth and then we move into Revelation 14 and what do we find? God's answer, God's remedy, God's solution, Jesus Christ, the Lamb standing. He's not slain anymore, he's risen again and with him are the redeemed of the Lord. Praise his name. In Revelation 13 we have the shifting sand of the sea and the unstable and tumultuous waters of the sea. Out of this chaos arose the revived Papal Roman Empire. The Fourth World Empire continued, but the whole edifice of human government now rests on brittle feet of iron and clay, as seen in Daniel chapter 2. The whole thing emerged out of instability and is also weak on its feet. Now, you don't build a massive structure on such unsure foundations, but this is what we have in human government, and it is important that we see this. Its bedrock is shifting sand. Well, there is no bedrock. It's standing on shifting sand, unstable waters, and feet of iron mixed with clay, and then set over against this is the lamb standing on Mount Sion. This is the stone kingdom of Daniel chapter 2, seen as a lamb standing on Mount Sion in Revelation 14. And when we go back to Daniel chapter 2, we see that this stone was cut out without hands, meaning it is not of human origin, and it smites the feet of the image, these feet that are of iron and clay, and breaks them to pieces, and the whole edifice collapses Meanwhile, the eternal kingdom of God becomes a great mountain that fills the whole earth. 
praise the Lord. In Revelation 13, the beast scene is exceedingly dreadful and fierce. It's a total monstrosity. Revelation 13 verse 2 says, And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, his feet were as the feet of a bear, his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power, his seat, and great authority. And also concerning this same thing, we read in Daniel 7 verse 7, A fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth, it devoured and brake in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. Then, to counter this, to oppose and to destroy it, we have a lamb as shown in Revelation 14. Now, from a human perspective, this is most unexpected. To counter such a dreadful enemy, we might have expected to see perhaps the lion of the tribe of Judah, as Jesus is depicted as in Revelation 5, or perhaps the king on his white horse with the sword coming out of his mouth, with the angelic host with him, as Jesus is seen in Revelation 19. But this is not the case in Revelation 14. And the fact is that Jesus Christ is presented to us as a lamb more times in the book of Revelation than as anything else. Let's contemplate this a little further and read Revelation 13 verse 7. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. We have the horrors perpetrated against the saints in Revelation 13. And then in Revelation 14 there is the Lamb standing and with him the 144,000 singing the victor song. We have the victory of the saints with the Lamb as their leader. Now carefully note this, nowhere else in the Bible are the satanic forces arrayed against the anointed of God shown to be so powerful and overbearing as in this book. And we can see that when the prophet Daniel saw this, he was extremely troubled by it and his countenance was changed as it is recorded in Daniel chapter 7. But now in the book of Revelation, we have the details of this hideous satanic system before our eyes, and it is terrible indeed. But then note that set against this is the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ and him crucified and risen again and seated at the right hand of God. And what is this telling us? It's not going to be by might, nor by power, but by by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Jesus is well able to deal with the very worst of all the problems that we could possibly encounter. And as the governments and kingdoms of this world are arrayed against God's people, what do we have to do? We need to look to the Lamb of God. He alone can save his people. Look to the Lamb of God. And again, I say we are on the victor's side and we must never, never give up. Amen. Note also that not only is this a lamb, but in the Greek it is the word anion, which is the diminutive form of the word for lamb, meaning a little lamb. In other, word, in other words, rather, it is telling us of the firstborn lamb that was to be offered up in sacrifice. In Revelation 13, we have the power of the dragon given to the beast that rules over the inhabitants of the world. And then set against this is a little lamb, a sacrificial lamb. But this lamb is not dead, but alive and standing in that place of all power and authority. Back in Revelation chapter 6, we saw the lamb appear at the fall of the pagan Roman Empire. In Revelation chapter 14, the lamb appears in connection with what is going to be the final and complete fall of the Papal Roman Empire, including its continuance in this world today, and this is covered in Revelation chapter 16 onwards. In Revelation 6 verse 16, there is an aspect of the Lamb of God which is revealed to us. In that verse it says, And said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. This is the same word anion that is used in Revelation 14. The lamb is the little lamb, the sacrificial lamb, but as we have been seeing, he is 
risen from the dead. He is standing. All power is his in heaven and in earth. And also now we see the wrath of the Lamb. Jesus is not just sitting back, as it were, waiting for time to pass. In the book of Revelation, he is standing. And then there is also his wrath, his great anger at the wicked. And he is going to throw down and smash to pieces the whole edifice of human government. And not only that, it's going to be replaced with the kingdom of heaven on earth. That his will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Praise the Lord. In Revelation chapter 17, we are getting close to the end of this fourth world empire. And there we see this great beast pitted against the lamb. Again, it is in the Greek, Anion, the little lamb, pitted against the lamb and his anointed. And we read in Revelation 17, verse 14, These shall make war with the lamb, and the lamb shall overcome them. Not might, but shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. This is the 144,000. It is the Lamb and the redeemed. And this removes all doubt that this Lamb and his anointed will be that which shall overcome this entire dreadful monstrosity of devilish and satanically inspired human government that continues in this world to this very day. Fret not thyself because of evil men, neither be thou envious at the wicked. We are on the right side, we are on the victor's side, and all those that put their trust in Jesus Christ shall not be ashamed. Praise the Lord. Also in Revelation 19 verse 7 we read, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honour to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And he said unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said unto me, These are the true sayings of God. There is great reward before us. Hebrews 10 verse 35, Cast not away therefore your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. Let's go back to Revelation 14 verse 1 again, where we see the Lamb standing on Mount Sion, and then it says, And with him... And hundred forty and four thousand having his father's name written in their foreheads. Let us dwell on these, the redeemed, for a moment. Despite all the fear, the opposition, persecutions, conflicts, trials, and temptations, the hundred forty four thousand who represent the redeemed of the Lord, the remnant still stand with the Lamb. And we have seen how real and terrible that opposition and persecution has been. It's been dreadful in the extreme, and who knows what the future may, may bring. But Christ has been with his people, and his people have stayed with him. 1 John 5 verse 4, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Revelation 2 verse 7, To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Revelation 2 verse 26, And he that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. Revelation 3 verse 21, To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am set down with my father in his throne. Psalm 16 verse 11, Thou wilt show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Praise the Lord. Psalm 45 verse 15, With gladness and rejoicing they shall be brought. They shall enter into the king's palace. John 17 verse 12, those that thou gavest me, I have kept, and none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Isaiah 43, verse 2, And when thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee, and through the rivers they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. 
What a wonderful encouragement we have presented to us in this chapter. We can endure whatever is before us if we stand with the Lamb, for the Lamb is standing with us and we need to trust in Him. Praise the Lord. Concerning the 144,000, Revelation 14 verse 4 says, These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever He goeth. Now that is an easy thing to say, but the doing of it can be another thing altogether, especially when the way forward is rough and steep and the crowd is going another way. And then you and I are called to the fellowship of his sufferings, as Paul says in Philippians 3 verse 10. And as we have seen, so many, so many followed Christ all the way. They followed him unto death. So let a man examine himself. Let you and I examine ourselves. How, how far will we go in our following of the Lamb? We need to be prayerful about this. In the hymn, My Goal is God Himself by Francis Brook, the words are these. My goal is God Himself, not joy, not joy nor peace, nor even blessing, but Himself my God. Tis his to lead me there, not mine but his, at any cost, dear Lord, by any road. So faith abounds forward to its goal in God, and love can trust her, Lord, to lead her there. Upheld by him my soul is following hard, till God hath full fulfilled my deepest prayer. No matter if the way be sometimes dark, no matter though the cost be oft times great, he knoweth how I best shall reach the mark. The way that leads to him must needs be straight. One thing I know, I cannot say him nay. One thing I do, I press towards my Lord. My God, my glory here from day to day, and in the glory there my great reward. This is the end of part one.